Well, hello. My name's Penny. I live in the southeast of England with my husband Pete and my four chickens. They're still in lockdown, but they're being very, very good. And there's a little film of them at the end. That's all there is this week. It's been very misty, rainy here in the southeast of England. So we went out for our walk earlier in the week, and that's been it. We've been in, unless we wrap up in our waterproofs and all of that. It's very, very fine rain. And that, no, so had a lot to do this week, been very, very busy. And yeah, I thought I'd just come on board and say hello. So what am I going to talk about this week? Well, last week I showed you uh, my shushi and my dummy and my bouncing ball. And whilst Pete and I were out for our walk this week, um, another catchphrase came up. Oh, that's what I'm watching on telly. Do you watch it? Catchphrase. I really enjoy it. I love the presenter. He has good guests. And it's quite fun guessing. Anyway, there was the phrase that we've said for donkey's years. Two small girls in the back, out for a little country ride. And Pete was eating an apple. Just driving down this very small country lane. I mean, it almost had grass down the middle. And he threw his apple, gave it to me actually, and he threw. I threw it out onto the side grass verge. Well, it wasn't even a verge. We were right up close. The little mice will eat it, you know. Before we knew where we were, there's a police car stopping us. It, it, and Pete got out very respectfully. And, uh, well, one of the policemen stayed in the, in the car. He was, seemed very embarrassed, Pete said. But the other one said, <clears throat> what did you throw? I noticed you threw something out your window, sir. Um, and Pete said, yes, I did. Normally, we would never throw anything out. We're not, you know, we brought up, take your litter home, pick your litter up, all of that. But we threw this apple core out because we knew that it would drop down and, and the little mice would eat it or whatever. My chickens love apples. Cut them in half and they peck away. Anyway... He said, one thing leads to another, sir, which of course is quite right. Well, not quite right in our case, because one thing doesn't lead to another. But yeah, he's dealing with the general public, isn't he? So that's become our catchphrase. And we were walking down our road that, you know, we always walk down to get to the sea. And people tip there. They do tip. You've seen it in my little films. And as we looked at it, Pete said, one thing leads to another, sir. Are we the only ones that keep hold of these little little um, sayings? I'm putting up a, a little clip here of Nicholas. Do you remember I told you in a couple of episodes ago, how are you riding your bike, Nicholas? Confidence and balance, man. So that's another one of our sayings, of course. Confidence and balance. So here he is my confidence and balance boy. And of course, I asked if they, asked them if they would mind. I put up their wedding photo. I can't remember if it's four years. I think it's five years this year they've been married. And I think he's 31. Anyway, who cares? It was a gorge, opposite to his brother. This day was a scorcher. And he wanted a very small wedding. I think they had 30 sit down in the most gorgeous, it was like a little country club that looked right out over, over, oh, it was beautiful, the countryside. And a lovely day was had by all. So I'll put a couple of photos of his wedding here. Confidence and balance. Well, I'm working through, oh, I wanted to show you this before I get on to anything else. Do you remember I knitted the Ridari and it really didn't take me very long for Pete and he loves it. So ideal for this weather because it's warm but as you know it sheds off the, you know, it's not waterproof but you know keeps you dry if it's a little bit damp like it is at the moment. However the Icelandic jumpers are the same on the front and the back so he didn't really like it and then you know being low at the back and high here. So all I did was I undid the cast off, kept the needle there in the front, so it was there, 
And then I, I did short rows, German short rows. I just guessed it. And uh, so he's got a higher bit at the back. Still got its little roll, but can you see this higher bit at the back? Just German short rows, <clears throat> which means you knit a few stitches, put your wool round, turn, and then knit it to the end where you want it to be. Put your wool round, turn, and there it is. So he's now got a neck that's higher at the back and shorter at the front. And he's very pleased with that. It looks nice. So if any of you are doing that, you could uh, consider just doing those short rows to make the back longer. It, it looks all right. It looks like it's meant to be, really. I mean, it's all in the black, which is exquisite wool. It's got bits of green in it. and Yeah. So I thought I'd show you that. I'm working through my whips. Something happened this week. As you know, my friend came to stay last week. Uh, well, we did have a good time and I felt a bit low when she'd gone, I'll be honest. We haven't seen people for so long and it was such fun. We did have fun last week and that's what I needed. So it felt a bit, you know, the house was clean and tidy, but what's the point of that? I wanted a bit of a laugh and I missed it. Anyway, on the Friday she said, Pam, let's go to that local place you told me about. What one's that? Smart Frog. Oh, well, it's literally down the road, literally down the road. You know, you can walk there in, in, in six minutes. And the lady there, Alison, her name is, she, she's she got, well, it's as big as this conservatory. She's got a long arm quilter, a quilting machine. But she does it by hand. So she doesn't roll the quilt on and then the quilt just go like that. At the side, she's got this paper and it's got the design on, which I've chosen. It's like a daisy. I thought it went. She's got loads of rolls of paper and she, she gave me a choice of about four and I was happy with the, with the second one actually. And so she, she puts that along the edge and then a laser, she follows that design. And as she follows that design with the laser, the actual machine does the quilting on the quilt. So it is done by hand, but it's done by machine as well. Massive. Well, you can get the quilts. As you know, my quilt sits on my bed, which is two singles zipped together. You know, it's a queen, I think they call it. Anyway, my hands being as they are now, I made this with my granddaughter actually, you know, a few years ago when she came round, we just sat and we did it together and she chose it all and laid it all out. So it's, it's a bit special. I didn't just want to let it go. I have shown it to you in previous episodes. It's, um, it's the ones where the hexagons, I made a hexagon flower sewed it on a square and then sewed them all together. The Tilda and Liberty prints. So anyway, let I said all right and she sells fabric and she used to do classes but of course with with the lockdown and all of that she hasn't started those up again. And blow me down, do you remember me telling you how I got into quilting? Went to my local um you know where you have the classes, not evening classes, but yeah. And I joined for dressmaking and I just went along for half an hour and thought, I can do this. This isn't right for me. She was teaching you how to put a zip in and I can put zips in. So I went down to the office and they said, well, do you want to choose another course? I didn't know what course to choose. Oh, I said, quilting, never heard of it. I'll do that. Of course, that's been the bud now. But I don't know when that was. Was it about 25, 26 years ago? And so I was taught by this wonderful woman, Tina, and taught me properly, all by hand. And also she did machining things when she made the little bags and we had machines in the class. But basically we did it by hand. Oh, well, we did. We did the quilting. And that's how I learned all my techniques 
you've got to get it just right. If you get it just right, it works. Anyway, of course, I've always quilted by hand too, but I think the time has come to see what Alison can do for this big quilt. So I took it along. We bought some fabric, yes. There is this saying, have you heard it? Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. And uh, that's all very well. And that's how I do live my life. I let my yes mean yes. If I say I'm going to do something, if I can, I will. But, yeah, I don't really want to apply it to this, you know, yarn and fabric. I'm not going silly this year, as a lot of people aren't. I'm getting through my whips. But what was stopping me doing my whips was having this quilt sitting there. It's just too big for me now. So I'll take you along when I take it round. Because I'd done a bit of quilting on it, I needed to bring it home and undo that. It wasn't too much. And then I'm going to drop it round. And when I drop it round, I'll take you with me. And I'll show you the machine. And then I'll show you what it looks like uh, having been machine quilted. So smart frog, yeah. So that was quite an adventure. Well, it was lovely, actually. Thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. So that's been a weight lifted off my shoulder and it has meant that I can get on with my whips. It, I don't know, it's just freed me up because all the time I could see that quilt sitting there. So I have finished one this week and I'll show you him. him out. Here he is. Little tail. I absolutely love him. And his little hat. So he's ready to come out for a walk. <laughs> he's a darling, isn't he? But he has got this, this little look of, yes, he wants to know as if he's just arrived here and he wants to know what's going on. So I finished him. You start knitting him in one piece. You start at the nose, so small. You know, you've got, I don't know, a stitch on each needle and you go round and round and round. I didn't put eyes in, I just did the little embroidered eyes because I thought, you never know, the hat sits on, it won't come off. I mean, you can take it off, but um, it's, a, it's a nice tight fit and his little ears sit in between. <laughs> he's got short legs like mine, but yeah, he's rather cute. And then I did him the fisherman rib jumper in um, the wool is by um, you know Ellie craft house magic I had some for, for various things that I've knitted I th thought it suited him it's a nice nice bright color and a little bit of red in the top one so there he is he might sit on the set here with Duncan uh, Duncan's over there. You see that at the beginning. Um, I didn't it, not Duncan, and show you. Um, but he might just sit with me when I do my little bit of knitting and my sewing in his teacup because he likes it. You can just tell. Whoops. No, you're not getting out what for the minute. But what's your name? Could be Bertie, couldn't you? Bertie the bear. Let's call him Bertie. That's his name, Bertie. So, I fancy knitting him a little scarf to go with his hat. We'll see. So that is a whip. That's off my needles now and it's done. So, the next thing is in here. And as you know, what did I do before I made project bags? I made that with that. And then inside is that and this is my next one my next whip i haven't actually started it so it's not a work in progress yet yet but it's been sitting there ready to do i think that's all i wanted to say oh apart from well i'll tell you that we've got the fascinating fact and i'll tell you that when i come back see you in a minute the south american bush katia did has ears less than a millimeter long Yet they work in a way very similar to human ears. The insect can distinguish a wide range of frequencies from long distances. 
For example, it can tell the difference between the sound of another katya did and the ultrasound of a bat that is hunting. Scientists have discovered a unique organ inside the ear of this insect, a pressurised fluid-filled cavity that looks like an elongated balloon. The acoustic vesicle, as it's called, is responsible for the katyadid's remarkable hearing. Professor Daniel Robert of the University of Bristol School of Biological Sciences in the United Kingdom says this discovery will help engineers develop bio-inspired hearing devices that are smaller and more accurate than ever before. Researchers believe it will also contribute to the next generation of ultrasonic engineering technology, including imaging systems for hospitals. Well, there we are. Talk about hearing. I suffer from tinnitus and it's rather annoying. You know, for me, it's like a very high pitched whistle all the time. And so I've got a local hearing place, Regain Hearing, and I went along and had my hearing tested and they found that the high notes, yeah, I'd lost some hearing there. Whilst I can hear people, this, this tinnitus, is it gets on your nerves a bit. So they said try some hearing aids. So I borrowed some for a couple of months actually, just to see how it went. And yeah, they're called... What are they called? Oh, here. I've got them here. Oticon. Is that how you say it? But I have found it very helpful, particularly when I'm watching television. And I like it. I've got them in now. You just cannot see them. They are so small. They're tiny little things. And they suit me very well. So I splashed out. You can't say treated yourself to some, but if it helps with ringing in your ears then uh, it is a bit of a treat actually so yeah anyway I wanted to tell you about what I'm wearing I made the buttons myself I just covered them and this is um, fine lace and kid silk haze knitted together and it is so warm but so light I wonder if I can stand up and show you it has this little it's very pretty at the back it sort of goes in with, yeah, um, but it's so light, but it's so warm. That's what I like about it. And I've got quite a few Kim Hargrave, Kim Hargrave's books because I love, absolutely love her. Her designs are beautiful. And this one is in 21 Designs by Kim Hargrave's Shadows. And there's not much point in me showing you it because I don't think it's very good photography actually because they've done it, it's called Will and they've done it in a navy. And you know even if you're here looking at the book, ow, looking at the book you can't really see it very well. But I knew I liked it because of the what it was knitted with. And I love cable. Absolutely love cable. And oh, and I feel too dreadful because a friend of mine sent, uh, sent me a photo. Oh, this is the back of what I'm doing. Cable's all up the back. And she just missed a couple. You know how you can. It's so easy to do. Well, before she could let me say, you know, let, either bring it to me when you come and stay or I'll show you how to do it. Just you just undo that little row and twist it the right way. It doesn't take a minute. And when when I next messaged, I, I was going to say, bring it to me if you don't feel confident. Or it's very easy to. Next thing, she had undone it all. Oh, I felt dreadful, but I felt I had to point it out at the same time too. Oh, so I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry you undid it all. But anyway, this is a beautiful pattern. Um, and a beautiful book, lots of lovely things in there. I can recommend Kim Hargreaves. So that's it, isn't it? So what's coming up next? Ah, I've just seen Yarn Works. I've sent off for a couple of um, 
Stains of Wool, the Irish Artisan Yarn. And it's the most luxurious wool I've ever knitted with. I knitted the um, River Shawl. And I think I showed you it in episode four. But I'm going to knit one uh, as, um, as a present for someone. So when the wool comes, I'll show you that next week and I'll show you as I knit it along. Yeah, I'm, I'm rather looking forward to that. So now I'm going to say, not cheerio, I'm going to say, uh, it's Pete and me having a chat. We have a little chat about some of his early memories and then straight after that, I'm going to put the little film up and it's, um, yeah, of, of the chickens. Because we have the fields going down to the sea and they've harvested all their cauliflowers, but they've left so many to plough in. And so I just picked them a collie up. Actually, they don't eat the whole collie. They like the leaves. <laughs> and every time we go out, I just pick some leaves because they're going to plough them all in and they love them it keeps them going at the moment oh and i must put up here i forgot to say for my grandson you know my shushi and my dummy and my bouncing ball jimmy for his wedding i made him a log cabin quilt and he went to wales we have dark areas i think they're called are they dark areas where there's no lighting around and he proposed to um his wife now, Tegan, he proposed on this, well, is it a mountain or a hill? Where it was absolutely dark and he chose a special night where he knew it was going to be really starry, starry, starry night. And so I made him the quilt, I'll put it up here, and I did it with Liberty. She likes, um, yeah, she likes pink. She's a very pink girl. And anyway, I made it pink and blue his, his and hers, log cabin, and in the centre I put a little um, crystal just to represent the stars. So that was his quilt, and then I'm putting up uh, some photos here of the quilt I did for Nicholas for his wedding. Yeah, well, Nicholas got married in the June, and Jimmy got married in the September, so all of a sudden we had these weddings, and I was doing these quilts, and I did... Um, a wedding ring quilt for Nicholas and Ellie and uh, yeah she said we could put it all up and that was just scraps bits and bobs um, and I chose just a little off-white it wasn't a pure white for the center and did a little design and uh, yeah she has it on the back of their settee so Anyway, I'm going to say cheerio. We're going to have waffle now with Pete and me and then a little film about the chickens. So I'll see you next week. I think all being well, I'm going to be starting reading Mum's diaries. She wrote a diary in 1958. So I think we're going to sit together and do that. So I'll say cheerio then. This is goodbye and I'll see you next week. Yeah, I don't feel right. Do you move up? I bit. feel perfectly all right. No, but I don't. Do you? Oh, what, do you me? think so? Uh, I don't better. know. I've got a knit and just you know, I don't chat know with you. you. Yeah, that's yeah. true. You've got you to sit. To You've got to be comfortable. Like. Yeah. Right, we start again. Cause right. It's... So, <sighs> what? Oh, we're starting. You're going to yeah. have all that in the front. I just cut it oh, off. I just cut it off. Right. Yeah. Okay. You don't need your glasses on, do you? Not, I suppose not, but I squint. Okay, put them on then. Because it's bright in here, and these these are uh, okay. Uh, you know. So what we're going to talk about today is a couple of your memories, really early memories, and that's why it's so lovely that I'm finding my memories with Mum and saying, "Oh, you know, is this right? Is this right, Mum?" And your memories are just your memories, aren't they? Well, because yeah. Because you can't ask anybody now, and it's quite frustrating. I'm the only one left. Yes, you are. From Everybody big... else. Right, we'll start again. We don't want to talk about that. Oh. Right. Okay, okay so uh, this morning Pete's going to tell us about a couple of his memories, really early memories. I think the first one, you were in your pram, weren't you? Yep. And because you thought, how can I have a memory of, of me and my pram, you did ask your mum um, yeah. and she verified it. Yeah, yeah. What well, was the memory, Pete? You've got to remember back then that 
We stayed in a pram for quite a long time as a child, and I was about two. I about suppose. two, right. Mum would take me out, she was shopping. Yeah. And uh, we, I was outside the Wonderloaf Bakery, and uh, waiting for her to come out. And this old man came along and peered into the pram, peered at me, and then he hit the pram with, a, with his stick. With his, you know, walking stick that he had. Yeah. Walking. Of course, I, cool. I, I don't know what I did. I can't remember. I just remember. You just that, remember him hitting the pram. Yeah. And mum came out of the shop. Yeah. Because he used to leave babies out the shop then, didn't they? Yeah. Because um, they couldn't take the prams in the shop. No, they were too big. Too I mean, big. prams were... <laughs> yeah, so babies were, you know. were lined up outside. But they were, and all the shopping would go in the oh, underneath the pram. And, yeah. I mean, you see these old films and the kids are pushing those sort of prams about, having fun, aren't they, and in the streets and, and, and things. Uh, um, anyway, so I had this memory for years. And then, I, I can't remember when, but I, I said to mum, I told her about it, I said, is that true? Or did I just dream it or something? She said, no, she said, no it is true. Um, the gentleman, she called him, that did it, he was a veteran of the First World War, because you know, this was about 1947. Um, 1947, right. Yeah. And um, he's a, he was a veteran, but he got blown up and he suffered... From you know stress and uh, yeah. what we'd call now and PTSD and all of that. Every, she said all the all the women knew about him, but he never harmed anybody. He never hit a baby. It was something to do with that pram that right. triggered something. Yeah, and it hit the pram. It hit the pram. I thought. What would happen now if, if an old man went around hitting a pram? Yeah. You know, the women wouldn't say, oh, he was in the whatever, yeah. you know, he's been in Afghanistan and he's he's harmless, really. Yeah. So, and just get on with, you know, just let him carry on wandering about. Yeah. And, uh, but then the, the older women, my mum said, all the women, oh, we knew about him. We all felt sorry for him, poor old chap. You know, he'd gone through a lot. Yeah. And that, but that was my earliest memory. That's your earliest memory. The earliest That one. sound of that stick on that pram. Well, yeah, and the bloke peering in. Peering into the pram. Yeah, he looked in. All you know, oh, right. I don't know if he was seeing that there was somebody, a baby in there, so he only hit the pram on the side. Oh. <laughs> or if he, if, it, oh. if I hadn't been in there, he might have demolished the pram. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And what's your other memory? I was four. When I know I was four. Okay. Because I was in the paper. And we just can't find that bit of paper. No, Mum kept cut it out. Or it's a local paper, was it? No, I'm not sure. It, yeah. it probably was, yeah. Yes. But local from where? Because this happened in Epping Forest. Epping Forest, yeah. And there so, was a house called The Wilderness. It's not there now, but no. they do have commemorations for it. They had a festival in uh, 2019, I think, mm. um, because two famous people lived there. And one was, I've got his name here, Walter Spadbury. He did the, uh, the beautiful, I'm going to put a couple up here, beautiful paintings of, you know, visit Skegness, visit oh, Herne that's Bay, right. yeah, yeah. and, and it's spring. Oh, lovely. I'll put a few up here. They might be a little bit blurry because when you transfer over, it's not very good. They're beautiful, very evocative of the, of the time. And his wife happened to be an opera singer. She was called Dorothy Dorsey. Mm -hmm. And she put on this beautiful house called The Wilderness. Had a, it had a... had a stage in the back garden. It, but it was the stage was a grass stage. It was beautiful. It's like the lawn went boom. And then it like was a natural stage, a raise. Yeah. yeah. And, and they she put, used to put on operas. And Pete's cousin, my cousin Doris, yeah, was, you tell uh, the story well, she now. was a lot older than me because all my cousins were older than me. Yeah, uh, a lot older. They were like you like were uncles. the real baby. I was the baby you? of the whole. Yeah. yeah, uncles and aunties, I called them, but really they were cousins. And um, she, she put on operas. She, she was an opera buff, and uh, she, she liked doing all that. And in fact, it was such a coincidence because uh, my first job 
was in a second job was in in a solicitor's office oh, that's right, as yeah. a legal secretary, which I absolutely loved getting things just right in those days. And you know, he loved my my boss loved opera, and we yeah. used to go to handle operas yeah. and see them. And then he said, a few years after when we had conversations, I've was been in a local one. Pete's cousin. Well, what a coincidence, <laughs> yeah. wasn't it? But um, it was it was it was, it was it, the thing was. Within the family, it was Doris. Oh, she's doing her opera stuff, right? And, and it all seemed like it was just something, you know, that yeah. oh, you know, just, just to amuse her, she's doing this opera oh, stuff. To amuse but her. <laughs> these operas are pretty, pretty high standards, they were. You, you know. And they were uh, super. But anyway, so she had this opera that she she was producing in the wilderness. Yeah. And she asked, and she said to Mum, "Look, I want Peter as as a Cupid." A, a, a cherub. All right. And so I had to have. <laughs> so I was, I was four, and I can remember getting all dressed up. And I had this. I had to have this bow and arrow. Yeah. And the arrow was nailed to the bow, so it, you know, so it wouldn't. And I had to dance down the side of the garden where all the people were sitting through the audience, and then go up onto the stage. And I, that, I, after that, I can't remember what I did. All I can remember. Is this flipping arrow? Yeah, was pointing at me. Oh, and every time I tried to turn it round to point away, it just went and, it was, and, I, round and all the way you. down while I was oh. trying to dance, and I was trying to put this arrow straight, oh. so it was in the right direction, and uh, uh, that is so vivid, you know. And but I, what but a I can't, but I can't remember any other bit about it. I don't know what I did on the stage. Uh, I can't remember. It's just gone, but that bit. Did about, you? You yeah. don't think because Pete had a beautiful singing voice. I don't know if I sang. I might have done, but I know it's all true. And I was there because uh, Mum had this paper said, "Peter, age four, takes a bow." Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and there was a little article on it which I can't remember yeah. what it said. And you have written a little story about a competition you were in, singing competition for the school, I think. Oh, this, you'll yeah. You'll have to dig that one out. Oh, well, yeah. there was nothing really. I was in the competition. I came second. Yeah. Anthony Lane wrote, came first. You wrote a nice little story about it, so we like hearing oh, those. You can read that then. I will, I'll it. read it. But so there That's we are, two famous people and uh, still commemorating this beautiful house, the wilderness. But I have just let him out because thank you so much for all your lovely comments. I do yeah. so love them. And um one comment, yeah, you said you'd love you're in the in the mood for a new frying pan. But hope a chef comes attached. But I said, sorry, I've just let him loose now. Yeah. He's usually chained to the cooker. Absolutely. Can't yeah. get out of the kitchen. Chicken? Kitchen. No, you're in the kitchen doing what you should do. So. And now and again, I let him out just to tell just, his yeah. little story. If I'm on good behaviour, yeah. I know. So we'll say cheerio. <laughs> Lovely to see you. And what? Bye-bye. Oh, bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just got to come back on because I have Tommy once a week and it's his day today. And he's got the little jumper on that I knitted in previous episodes, if you remember. And uh, say hello, Tommy. Say hello. Here he is. Look, he's a biggish boy. Now, how old is he? Is he eight nine weeks? weeks nine nine yeah, weeks. Nine weeks. And here he is. Hey, say Tommy. Tommy. Here he is. Say hello to the viewers. Yeah, so I was just doing chin wag, and uh, so then it's my time to have him. So I have him for a few hours each week, so it's lovely. So there we are. We'll say cheerio then. Bye. <laughs>